yourself the question, what makes me, me? At a certain point in all of our lives, we recognize there's a value in exploring our roots, figuring out the forces at work on what makes us who we are, and digging in a little bit deeper, because we know that once we understand more of these things, we can help us, it can help us to make choices to better able to thrive into the future. And so we do things, and you may have done things like looking into your ancestry to figure out where you've come from. Maybe you wanted to find a birth parent. Um, you know, we do things like to, take, uh, to design a genogram to begin to plot out what were the systems in place with my family of origin and explore what they passed along to us as well. You know, maybe you did all sorts of things like, like ask your parents at a certain point more pointed questions about the past and where your family and where you come from. Or maybe one of the things that I did, and maybe you've done this too, is, is to take a DNA test. A couple years back, I took one of these tests kits that's widely available online, and I did it because I have a pretty unique last name. My name is AJ, my last name is Mastic. And you know, when Megan and I were signing up for our wedding registry 13 years ago, um, in the store, the only other Mastic in the system was a cousin of mine. Uh, that, you know, if you have this last name, I know how you're related to me already. I haven't met a Mastic that I'm not related to until four years ago. I met someone who is connected to this small group of mastics in Pennsylvania, and we had a pretty good idea of where the link may be, like six or seven generations back, but we weren't really sure. For, so for fun, we both took these DNA tests, and, and while it was a little bit inconclusive because it was such a distant relation, it was amazing to see all the other things that the test discovered in my DNA, and I think most of us, we have an understanding that certain things are passed along to us through our genes, right? That uh, things like your eye color are passed along, or your blood type, right? Um, maybe your, your earlobes, you know, whether you have attached or detached earlobes, uh, you know, we know these things are passed along genetically, our hair color. But this test was also able to reveal a number of other traits with a high degree of accuracy. I was blown away. It said that I likely have a ring finger that's longer than my index finger, which barely, but that, that checked out. Um, you know, it, it said that I was likely, you know, very light-skinned. It didn't say pasty, but I feel like it wanted to go there. It, it felt that the, the dis was in there. Um, you know, that I like cilantro. It can predict that, right? Uh, that I have red hair. You know, it, it understood all those things about me from my genes. Uh, it also said that I might have a unibrow, so <laughs> I don't know. I'll let you guys be the judge. Um, you can stop looking at it now. Um, but it was off about some other things. It said that I was likely uh, without any freckles, which, have you seen like the hundreds of thousands on my arm alone, right? Um, it likely said that I had thick facial hair, which I do okay, but I don't know about thick. And this is the best one, guys. Uh, it, it said that I have genes commonly found in elite performance athletes. <laughs> Uh, you know, especially endurance athletes. I've never run more than five miles in my life, guys. Uh, I'm just saying, I think that part of the test is still being calibrated. Um, but I think this understanding that, you know, we want to know where we come from. And on, on Easter, we kicked off this new series. Who was here of Easter? Show of hands. Uh, big shout out, whoop. Uh, we had a great Easter service, and uh, Dion Garrett introduced this new series, Me, Myself, and Why, and exploring this idea of living in sync with our truest self. That if we want to, in our relationships and in our vocations, if we want to live the abundant life, uh, then we've gotta get real about where we come from and what makes us who we are. 
You are so much more than biological math. And I believe that God wants to show us how we've actually inherited an incredible birthright from our Heavenly Father. And so today we're gonna be digging in, uh, we're gonna be in the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter nine. If you have your Bibles on your phones or you brought your Bible with you, you can bust those out. We're gonna camp out there for a while. Uh, but the Gospel of John, Gospel means good news, and the good news of John is, is one of the four accounts written about the life and ministry of Jesus. And in John chapter nine, we'll see the story of Jesus healing a blind man. And I think that in this story is so much that God wants us to take to heart. There's some myths we, ha we have to get to the bottom to and dispel things that we believe that maybe aren't true, but also just some things that we really need to understand as we understand what it means to live this abundant life in Jesus. So we're gonna spend some time here in John nine, and here's where things start off. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? That's crazy, but we'll get there. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So it's kind of crazy to us that after witnessing this man born blind, the first place that the disciples go is someone screwed up. I, I don't know who, right? I don't know if it was mom or dad or somehow even the guy himself, but someone messed up. Because in their minds, hardship and handicap and suffering in life always was the fault of someone. It was, a, it was because someone didn't have enough faith. It was because someone committed some specific horrendous sin, and so this should be seen as a sort of curse from God. This is crazy to us. I don't think any of us would ever look at someone for having a physical handicap and go, that's because it's your fault somehow. But that's what their culture did at the time. And Jesus often in his ministry had to fight against this cultural belief that was widely held, which even his disciples seemed to hold. Uh, there was another time he was talking about a tower that fell on some people and killed them. And he's like, do you think they were worse sinners because of that? No, it just happened, right? And, and so often I think we, we have this, these false understandings and I think right off the bat, sort of illuminating that it's okay for us to question widely held culturally beliefs and to, to make sure they check out because they don't always check out and sometimes just because everyone believes them, it doesn't make it right. And bad theology hurts people. Theology is important. Bad theology hurts people and we, the case study is right here in this text. I mean, just imagine going through life as this man, this blind man did, hearing it might be your fault and, and the self-worth sort of wavering uh, because of that and, and just asking that question of why, God? Why was I, of all the people, born blind? blind? You know, I don't know what the statistical probability is of being born blind, it's low. Why did he win that lottery? He had to ask himself those questions all the time. And, and we ask these questions about ourselves too. There's things that we're born with that we go, why? You know, maybe there's something that just has never come easily to you like it does for others. Other people seem to pick it up intuitively and, and yet you've always struggled with it. Maybe it's a, a subject matter or it's a skill that you would just love to be as good as others or as good as that person at, but you just aren't. And if there was something you could change about yourself, you would change that in a minute. Or maybe there's another thing that you would change about yourself. Maybe it would be a character defect, that you know that there's this thing that you do and that if other people knew the full depth of it um, and how you haven't all, all always been a, a great son or daughter or parent or spouse or friend, and if they knew kind of where your mind goes sometimes, they would be ugly. And maybe you would change that about yourself if you could, right? Or maybe you would change something about your physical appearance. You know, maybe the way that you look or your body type. Maybe you'd, you'd love to be shorter or, or taller or bigger or, or smaller. Maybe you've had a health issue that we, you were born with and it's just been part of your journey and you don't know why you were singled out, but it's something you've had to deal with. Why was I made like this. Why is this weakness in me? 
We ask those questions. Decades ago, it was thought when this sort of study of genetics kind of came out mainstream and, and all of us began to sort of be taught a little bit about it, it was kind of thought that maybe it wouldn't be too long before the whole human genome would be sort of mapped out and our genes would be able to tell us all sorts of incredible things uh, about who we are sort of biologically and, and maybe even our personalities and why we do the things that we do and why we are who we are. And it's been able to do some of that. You know, the study of genetics has revealed a lot of really helpful things to us, like who we may be related to, or if we're prone to alcoholism or certain disorders, or what we might pass along to our kids. But it's also still a very much emerging area of study. And most of us were taught way oversimplistic versions of genetic science, right? I mean, two blue-eyed people do not just make a blue-eyed kid. Uh, there is no gay gene, right? It's not that, that simple. Um, the reality is dominant genes aren't the most prevalent in society always. It doesn't mean that in every case, right? That um, one single gene usually doesn't just control a trait. Uh, and that, while our physical stuff, you know, oftentimes, I'm probably not gonna get any taller, guys. Five, seven, I think is about it. Uh, but when we believe that our personality and, and sort of our weaknesses are just locked in and, and you know, just encoded and can't be changed, then we buy into this sort of fatalistic view, this idea that the disciples bought into that some of us and that all of us in some sense or another are just born less valuable and less worthy to God and to society. And you know what, the blind man, he is sinful. Um, you and I, we are sinful. Um, but I think there's, there's something that we get wrong about this. I think God still looks at us with incredible value and worth. And I think Christians, we have this understanding sometimes, this, uh, you know, I, th I think it's based on truth, but we kind of go a little bit awry because we know that we're sinful by nature, you know, in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and not done, right? Sometimes the things that God has put in front of us, and he says, go, this is what I made you for, sometimes we don't rise to the occasion, and even that is sin. And I think we know this, and so sometimes I think we just think that God looks at us as sort of ugly. But you know what? We, we may be sinful, but we're never trash to God. He sees us as incredibly worthy, worth redeeming, worth fighting for uh, to him we are his sons and daughters. And one thing that reminds us of this is the Apostles' Creed, this ancient statement of faith about what we believe and what we confess and hold in common as the people of God. The first article, the first part of it says this, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and, and of all creatures and all people in it. We learn this in the book of Genesis. Genesis is this incredible book. I think sometimes we think, you know, the Old Testament, what value is there in the Old Testament? It's old after all. But we would be in a huge deficit, especially without the book of Genesis, the story of where the earth and all people and all creatures came from. We'd be in a huge pit in our understanding of theology, which is the study of God, but also our understanding of anthropology, the study of what it means to be human. In Genesis, we read this, that God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Psalm 139 says it this way. It says, for God created us in our inmost being. God, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. This is incredible. And this, this is countercultural. It's counter to what sometimes our minds and hearts, where it takes us, uh, that to be human is not to be broken. Right? You know, sometimes we go, well, we're only human, and there's some truth to that. But to be human is not to be sinful and broken, it's to be created in the very image of God, beautifully and fearfully knit together, each and every one of us, by our creator. And what does that mean, the, the image of God in us? 
It means that we were created to have a relationship with our Heavenly Father, to be able to communicate with Him, to be like Him in holiness and in a desire to take care of creation and of one another. It's a beautiful thing to be created in the image of God. It's a beautiful thing to be human. And the brokenness comes later. The brokenness is sort of layered in with the fall of man, but it's not intrinsically what it means to be created in the image of God. That part is temporary. And a, a great illustration of this, I love it, is we celebrated Earth Day on Friday. Earth Day is this great day to celebrate the gift of creation that God has given us and also commit ourselves to taking care of it. It's sort of a recommitment to this, this first mission God gives us, gave Adam and Eve in the garden to be fruitful and increase in number and take care of this gift that God has given us. By, by a stroke of chance, a congregation I served previously, one of our members was none other than John McConnell, one of the co-founders of Earth Day and the man who created the Earth Day flag, you know, using that great image of the Earth taken from the Apollo 17 mission as it orbited the moon. And this is a, a day he always viewed it as an extension of his faith, to take care of the planet and to advocate for peace was an extension of the faith that God has given him. And, and I love this idea that the world may be broken. It may have be groaning under the weight of sin and sort of buckling, right? Because there's evil in this world. We all see it each and every day. But God is going to restore it and remake it. That far from sort of blowing up the world, Rather, when he comes back, it will sort of be to purge it and to remake it and shape it back to the beautiful place that he created in the beginning. And that sin and evil and brokenness will be no more. And so sinfulness and destructiveness, it isn't supposed to be part of this world or who we are. We're not to be defined by it, uh, but absolutely it's something that God is remaking in his image and it is worth the fight to him. And he proves it to us in John 9. In, in, as he continues, here's the actual healing. Jesus says, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, he made some mud with the saliva, and he put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. I love this idea he starts off with that night is coming. You know, sort of this metaphor of like today it's day, night is coming. And for all of us, there's limited time to do the works of God. That how many you know, sleeps do we have left? When we were younger, we measured things in sleeps, right? Uh, you know, when you don't understand calendars, you're just kind of like, okay, mom, dad, how many sleeps is it until my birthday? How many sleeps until Christmas, right? How many sleeps do you and I have? Could be a lot, could be a short amount, I don't know. It's all short in the eyes and in the perspective of our eternal God, right? But there's a sense of urgency that God has given us to love the people that is placed, our place directly in front of us, especially those that we may overlook. And Jesus, instead of just talking about this man, he transitions to talking to him. He honors him as being created in the image of God and he serves him and he, says, he reminds him, uh, Jesus does, that he says, I am the light of the world. It's this great, powerful reminder. And I love, in John's gospel, what he really gets at here, he really picks up on the, the theme about who Jesus is. He starts off his gospel in chapter one talking about who is this person who's come into the world. And, and often in these miracle texts, we immediately leap to, what's it saying that I need to do? Right, Peter walks on water and then he, he kind of drowns, right? And so, or is it like, oh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't keep my eyes off Jesus, and that's where we go first. And in this text, we, we maybe go, oh, I'm spiritually blind and I need to make sure that I'm not. Um, and we'll get there. Those are valid interpretations. But don't skip this huge, massive point in John's gospel here that this miracle teaches us much more about who Jesus is and who the man is standing in front of the blind man. 
In fact, this was foretold, this very miracle. In Isaiah chapter 35, this was written hundreds of years before Jesus was incarnate. It says, be strong and do not fear, your God will come. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be open and the ears of the deaf unstopped. A whole host of things that this Messiah and Savior would do. And this miracle just confirms all of that. I mean, in, right before this, in John chapter 8, at the end of the chapter, cha right before this, this miracle is recorded, there's this whole argument Jesus gets in with the teachers of the law. And, you know, he makes it clear that he is the Messiah. And they, they want to stone him, and it doesn't happen. But there's this, this whole tension around who is this man, Jesus, and the disagreement there. And that this teaches us is that we have a God of power who has come to heal and to restore his people, that we have a God in Jesus who is the light of the world for you and me to open the eyes of the blind physically, but also to restore us to our God spiritually. And what he does is he helps make sure that this man breaks the link between defining himself by his disability. But instead, Jesus defines him according to the value and worth that is God-given, that is innately given by the image of God created in him. And that the healing of his blindness is simply there in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. That forever this man would know the love of God that has been given to him and the Savior that he has been given. That in his brokenness, in his weakness, God's strength is sufficient. And that he starts from a position of being loved. You and me are loved from the start. You are loved from the get-go. You don't have to clean up your act to get God to accept you uh, as much as, as we might make to try to make people do that. He doesn't do that. Right? That with God, you have value and worth right away. You don't have to sort of work yourself into being more worthy of redemption to God. You just are valued because you are his son and daughter. It's in there. And don't let anybody or anything or any guilt or shame tell you otherwise. And so after this, there's this whole investigation. And the, the Pharisees and the teachers, they want to know how did this miracle happen? How was the blind man healed? And so they ask him for testimony and they ask his neighbors and friends, is this really the guy? And they ask his parents and so forth. But it's sort of a hostile interrogation on their behalf uh, because they're trying to disprove Jesus through all of this. And whenever that happens in scripture, it doesn't work well because Jesus is the real deal, right? Uh, but throughout this investigation, um, you know, they, they're not getting what they want and they sort of get angry with people. And, and here's where we kind of pick up when they're talking to the blind man a second time, trying to figure things out. It says, a second time they summoned the man who had been born blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. Jesus is a sinner. The blind man replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. See, I love that there's these questions in the midst of this whole miracle. Like, why does God in the flesh, Jesus himself, who has power over everything, why does he need to sort of spit and mix up this mud in order to bring healing? I mean, he doesn't need to, but so why does he do it, right? And, and we don't really know. It maybe harkens back to creation where God forms everything out of nothing and then he kind of shapes the world and, maybe, and he's bringing sort of this recreation to this man. Um, and, and there's also this question of why, you know, like how did Jesus do the healing? The, the, the teachers, they question the blind man and they're like, surely he's a sinner, testify to that. And he's like, listen, people, I don't know what he is, but I know this, I was blind and now I see. That's his testimony, that's his witness. He doesn't know a lot, but he knows that for sure. And that anyone who can do that is only doing it by the hand of God. And so we don't need to know all of the details. 
You know, it's really helpful in life to know all the forces at work on our identity, right? To know our family of origin and, and to get into maybe the DNA or whatever else. And it's helpful to know our environment and our education, how those factored into who we are today and why we react the way we do, why we deal with conflict the way we do, why we show love the way we do. Those are super beneficial. And you've heard us say that from this stage before. But we don't have to start there in order to know our value and worth. We have to start with who God says that we are and the healing that he brings us through the good news, through the gospel message of Jesus, that when we have faith in him, that he has redeemed and restores us and that he continues to work in our life from there on, right? We just need to know, I was blind, but now I see and I start with that. That is my identity from which everything else is built and everything else uh, it shapes us from there. But that's the key part to sort of make our stand mentally and emotionally. And Jesus wants to make sure we know it. And he goes on here in this story, you know, um, they continued to ask the blind man, uh, what did he do to you? How do you open, he, do you open your eyes? And the blind man, he gets a little testy. He says, I've told you already and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We're disciples of Moses. And, and it's, it's so crazy where they go to here. I mean, I think for all of us, whenever we're trying to see ourselves in a new light and grow, in a certain area of our lives, isn't it precisely at that moment when the old things, when they get hurled at us? I mean, hurling is, is I love the descriptor of that language, right? Throwing is different. Hurling to me is like when you can barely carry something and you have to kind of heave it at somebody. They're, they're intending these as solid burns uh, to this, this man born blind, right, who now can see. Uh, and it's always when new life has come to us that Satanists and they want to get in there and hurl and heave things at us, right? It's, it's when we're on the new nutrition plan that all the, the great foods that'll knock us off of it get tossed in front of us and we get more social engagements and so, so forth, right? Um, but we're always gonna be tempted to define ourselves by who we are. God wants to define us by who Jesus is. They, they say, we're disciples of Moses. Right? And they've, they've settled. They've settled for less than God has in store for them. Even Moses would say, you're crazy. When you've got Jesus right in front of you, be his disciples. Don't settle for less. Don't check that box for less. I was having an interaction with one of my daughters this past week uh, because one of my daughters kicked the other one. <laughs> and, and I talked to her, you know, I'm like, okay, um, what gives, and, and she was kind of like, well, kicking people is just how I let people know that I'm angry. <laughs> you know, it's almost like, like as if she's like, why are you talking to me? You know that I'm just, I'm a kicker, right? That's just what I do, um, you know? It's, and it's in me. And I had this whole conversation with her about, you're not a kicker, you're a person with a kicking problem right now. Uh, right? It's not a, a per part of who you are. And sometimes we see things that aren't part of who we are and we identify in them and we hold ourselves back by believing those lies that we are that sinful, we are that weak person, and that we are that person trapped in this thing and will never get out of it. But do not settle for that. Do not settle for any definition in your life other than that definition given to us by Jesus. You are sons and daughters of mine. Do not settle for anything less than abundant life found in him. And I love how the last part of this text really drives that home. So they're still in this argument, they're wrapping it up, and to the blind man they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth, how dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. And Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him he said, do you believe in the son of man? Who is he, sir, the man asked, tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. That 
the, the teachers of the law here in this passage, they demonstrate through their hurling of insults how we absolutely do not win arguments with people. That, that we do not look at people based on their, their body type or their, their handicap or their, their race or their age or their gender. We don't win arguments by uh, you know, hurling insults at, at those features of people or thinking of them as less valuable or worthy because they're someone who has some affliction uh, or because they disagree with us or even because they've had a hand in their own hardships in life. Sometimes we go, you know what, you caused it and that, that sort of to us is a, is a little bit of a judgment to us as well. You played your part in it. And we just don't treat people that way. God doesn't look at us conditionally based on what we've done, based on what our opinions are, all of that. But rally, rather, he accepts us because of the image of God in us. In he is re-imaging us as we follow along after Jesus that he's taken this man from social outcast to being in the body of Christ. He wants him to see that it's not just the physical miracle uh, and to miss the fact that the spiritual one, the spiritual healing of faith in the Son of Man, that's the main point. Don't miss it, right? If you feel like you have your life together but you don't have Jesus, then you don't have the real miracle. That's what he wants us to see right here, right? And so know for certain what God has done for us has changed everything. He's given us this incredible birthright that we have through our Heavenly Father. We've inherited from Him of being loved and accepting, of having abundant life in Jesus now and in store for eternity. That's the message of Easter, is God bringing life to us and we get to carry that message out too. And I think a great thing that really illustrates that is there's this Japanese art of kintsuji. It's really cool, it views the history of an object, of maybe a pot's brokenness and repair, the history of that as part of it, as valuable, as not a thing to be disguised and to be buried or be, to be hidden, but something to be augmented. And they repair this pottery with precious metals, with gold, with silver, with platinum, so that the cracks, far from trying to be disguised but never really able to be hidden, they're actually highlighted and beautiful because of what holds all of the pieces together. And we too are beautiful and valued because of Jesus who holds our brokenness together and our created beauty together through what he has done at the cross. There are some things about us we can change. There's some things we can't. But in all of it, we give it over to Jesus. He is the potter. We are the clay being reshaped in his image, and he is the maker of all good things. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you to be able to open your word and to hear these words, these true words of hope and of healing and restoration, Lord, that we can know for sure that if we have felt worthless, that you disagree, Lord, and you showed it by sending your son for us. Lord, you don't want us to live in shame or guilt any longer. Help us uh, to put those thoughts away if we need to, to trust someone with those thoughts so that we can hear these words loud and true for us. You are forgiven, you are mine. You were made in my image to reflect me to the ends of the earth. Lord, we pray for our friends and for our neighbors, for everyone who needs to hear the message of Easter, that you would help us to embody it and to articulate it, that more people would know the healing power of the gospel message. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today and being a part of our online Pathfinder community. If you're new here, you can find links to helpful resources below or go to our website at pathfinderstl.org. And while you're there, you can find links to our message podcasts so you can take us on the go, in the car, jogging, wherever you go, you'll never miss one of our messages. Remember to like, share, and comment. God's blessings on your week.